UFC Vegas 11 is over and in the books. Oh man, what a great night of fights we had. 14 fights on this event, only four of which went to decision. So I'm going to tell you which ones you should go back and watch and which ones maybe you could avoid. But let's get right into it. Here's the winners and losers of UFC Vegas 11. We open up the event with three bantamweight bouts in a row. The first of which being between Tyson Nam and Jerome Rivera. Right from the beginning of this fight, Nam appeared to be the better fighter. Now it was a good fight, very entertaining, but Nam started to pull away right from the very beginning all the way up to the very end. Nam was looking for that right hand the whole time and spent the whole first round barely missing it, but he found it in the second. Nam made the adjustment between rounds, listening to his corner and carrying that advice back into the octagon and was awarded with a second round TKO. Rivera looked good and confident in his UFC debut, but Nam was just too skilled and too seasoned. Tyson Nam is looking better and better with each fight, really starting to put it all together. At 2-2 two two in the UFC, winning his last two fights, it's safe to say that Tyson Nam has really found his groove. The next fight of the event, still in the bantamweight division, was between Andre Yule and Erwin Rivera. This was a very fun fight. This was the first of four fights to go to decision, and this one was a split decision. Although competitive, I felt that Yule clearly won all three rounds. Yule has always been a really fun first round fighter, and he didn't disappoint in this one either. A notable difference though, is that he carried that same pace and flamboyance into the second and third rounds. Both fighters looked really good in this fight, but it was Yule who showed us that we need to keep an eye on this kid. Some weight fight on this card was between Journey Newsom and Randy Costa. I was surprised to see that Costa was the underdog here. Granted, it wasn't as a big underdog, but of all the fights on this card, this is one I was pretty confident in my pick. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of guys out there that can give Costa some trouble, but I didn't think that Journey was going to be one of them. As this fight was starting, my wife, who doesn't watch fights, sat on the couch and laughed about Costa's nickname, the Zohan. We're a big Adam Sandler family. To which I responded, well, he's about to Zohan this kid. Sure enough, he threw a punch just to set up his kick and sent Journey on a trip to Dreamland. Next up is a featherweight bout between Derek Minner and TJ Laramie. Now, Laramie is a UFC newcomer, but he was not able to log much octagon time. This one didn't last long, and honestly, not a whole lot happened. Laramie shot on Minner, Minner got the choke, and that was that. It was a beautiful choke, though. Minner wrapped up the neck, wrapped up Laramie's legs with his own, and put Laramie's back up against the fence. Laramie just didn't have any room to escape this perfectly executed guillotine. As mentioned, it was Laramie's UFC debut. Maybe the big lights and big stage got to him. But simply put, Laramie made a bad decision shooting on the choke expert, Derek Minner. Next up was a women's bantamweight bout between Jessica Rose Clark and Sarah Alpar. This was Alpar's UFC debut, but it was Jessica Rose Clark who looked really good in this fight. Alpar came out looking to wrestle and pretty much nothing else. Clark had to deal with that early, fighting a slow clinch battle for the first few minutes, but Clark landed some good elbows and hurt Alpar there at the end of the first round. And from that point forward, it was pretty much all Clark. She started piecing Alpar up. She even won the clinch and wrestling game from then on. She hit Alpar with some devastating knees, and Alpar didn't want any part of it. All Alpar wanted to do was wrestle and looked uncomfortable with the thought of having to fight in any other discipline. Clark, though, showed some really good striking and Muay Thai and turned this wrestling match into a mixed martial arts match. For Alpar, you've just got to have more to offer when you step into the UFC octagon. She got pieced up, beaten up, and opened up. This one came with a lot of blood and a little bit of controversy too. For the second straight week, my guy Chris Taoni stopped the fight for an illegal strike that turned out not to be so illegal. Clark hit Alpar knocking her to her butt, but then delivered a knee to the face right before 
Alphard became a grounded opponent. It was really, really close, but Tyone got it wrong. But unlike Ed Herman, Sarah Alpar was unable to capitalize on the second chance. It should have been called a TKO right then and there, but instead Alpar got beaten on a little more, bled a little more, caught a few more knees to the mouth, and then got hit with a TKO anyway. Jessica Rose Clark breaks her two-fight losing streak and extends her UFC record to three and two. And Alpar is gonna have to reschedule her wedding photo session. flyweight bout between Maria Bueno Silva and Mara Romero Barella. This was a pretty quick fight. Barella immediately closed the distance and started to look for a takedown. She got it and Silva immediately started to look for the submission, going back and forth from armbar to triangle position from her guard. Barella just kinda hung out here, letting Silva get wrist control and work on her positioning. I don't understand why so many fighters want to hang out in the guard of a submission expert. Barella landed a good strike or two right off the bat. Why not stay on your feet and build on that? If you want to test yourself on the ground against a really good grappler, soften them up first. Tire them out a little bit. Well, she didn't do that, and Silva got the armbar submission win in only two and a half minutes. Barella tapped before her arm was really even extended. She knew what was coming. Silva wins her comeback fight after dealing with a knee injury and two surgeries over the past year and a half. Next up is the featherweight bout between Mirsa Bektik and Damon Jackson. Damon Jackson takes this fight on only three days notice to get back into the UFC. Bektik came out with a clear game plan, taking Jackson down immediately and Bektik was all over him, just really a step ahead in every grappling exchange. This is a fighter that favors position over submission, but doesn't often go for the kill. This one was no different, and it may have come back to haunt him. The first two rounds saw a high pace, with Bektik dominating most of it, but he got tired much faster than Damon Jackson did. After decisively losing the first two rounds, Jackson finally got a dominant position early in the third. He got Bektik in a guillotine choke, rolled over to a mount position, and subbed the tired fighter. You have to think that if Bektik had looked for the finish earlier in the fight, he just may have got it, but it was Damon Jackson who got the finish win. Our final fight on the undercard was a flyweight bout between number 13 Jordan Espinosa and number 14 David Dvorak. This is the second of four decision fights, and this one was pretty boring. Last week, I was pretty hard on some of the ranked girls, saying they were fighting on a plateau where neither fighter entered the octagon with a game plan or left the octagon having proved much. Well, Espinosa and Dvorak did pretty much just that. For a fight that was on the feet almost the whole time, this one had very little action. Remember as a kid when your little brother beat you at Street Fighter just by simply pressing B over and over, knocking you out with shin strikes, and you said, yeah, right, that would never happen. Well, Espinosa didn't get knocked out, but the leg kicks were pretty much the only effective strikes thrown. Coming in ranked as 13 and 14, each fighter could presumably climb the ranks a few spots with an impressive and emphatic win. But when 14 beats 13 with leg kicks by decision, the only moving to be done will be these fighters switching positions. On a 14 fight event, you can be excused if you have to miss one or two. And with only four fights going to decision, this is the one you're gonna wanna skip. So on to the main card. And this one kicks off with a middleweight bout between Kevin Holland and Darren Stewart. Holland enters this as the 260 favorite. I love Holland, but I thought that was pretty steep. As is every Kevin Holland fight, this one was very entertaining. Although the first two rounds were competitive, I thought Kevin pretty clearly won them both. But somehow one of the judges saw something different. The third round, though, was completely Stewart's round. In those first two, Holland gave us everything we love about him. Some kicks, some elbows, some unorthodox striking, and of course some trash talking. Holland just has some fun in there, and it's contagious. He's one of my favorite fighters to watch right now, and his star is definitely on the rise. 
To Stewart's credit, he very much tried to pressure Kevin to match his striking pace to matching blow for blow. There were even moments when Stewart seemed to mimic Kevin, throwing the same unusual strikes right after Holland threw him at him. I wouldn't call this a good strategy for other fighters, though. It's not like Darren exposed Holland and wrote the recipe on how to beat him. Okay, yes, if you can get Holland tired and take him down, maybe you can dominate him on the ground in the third, but there's two problems with that strategy. The first one is Kevin Holland can take a punch, as was shown in this fight and that Tiago Santos fight a while back. So you may drop the first two and still not be able to get the job done in the third. The second problem is you've got to make it to the third round. Darren is tough and took several shots that would have put down many other fighters. This fight was awesome. Both fighters looked great, and I'm sure that they both grabbed a lot more fans. Next up was a women's strawweight bout between number 15 Mackenzie Dern and Randa Marcos. Mackenzie Dern wins this one by a first round armbar, and it was simply beautiful. As soon as these girls touched each other, Mackenzie grabbed hold and climbed up Randa. Randa is a solid, well-rounded veteran and did not make this one easy for Mackenzie. But Mackenzie showed her class and put together some transitions and options. She worked on that arm from several angles, kind of knee-barring Randa's arm. Randa did what she could, but Mackenzie's just too good in that area. If you didn't see it and you like jiu-jitsu, you need to go watch this fight. It won't take you long, but you'll be entertained and you'll be impressed. Mackenzie comes into this fight ranked 15th, but that's the kind of performance that raises you a couple of places. She ties for the most submissions in UFC strawweight history with three, but it's pretty easy to predict that she'll break that record before long. Next up was the light heavyweight bout between number 11 Johnny Walker and number 12 Ryan Spann. Oh my cheese balls and biscuits! That's what I yelled out loud because my seven-year-old daughter had woken up and could hear me. No telling what I would have yelled if she was still asleep. This one was only three minutes, but a whole lot happened in those minutes. Walker immediately tagged Span. Span tied him up. Then Span tagged Walker and knocked him to the mat. Span gets on top. Walker escapes. Span and Walker hit each other at the same time. Johnny goes down. Span shoots. Johnny drops elbows. Span goes to sleep. It was awesome. Johnny's got power, but I'm really starting to think that his chin may be a bit of a question. He did not react very well to Span's punches, but he is back in the win column in a pretty big way. And when Johnny Walker wins, he's must-watch television. If Johnny can avoid the power punches of this division's big players, then he's got a bright future. Man, I would love to see him fight Prochaska next. If Walker versus Prochaska doesn't honey your buns, then you're not a real MMA fan. It probably won't happen, but this is still a really big win for Johnny Walker. Next up is the middleweight bout between Hamzat Shemaev and Gerald Mearshart. Holy monkey nuts covered in gravy and bastard farts. My daughter was back in bed and asleep, so I just let it go this time. It only takes Shemaev 17 seconds. No takedowns, no clinch. Mearshart didn't even get a chance to throw a punch. Although I had Shemaev winning this one, I still spent a lot of time talking to Mearshart over the past few weeks. And now I feel kind of foolish. I said Mearshart would not be easy. Hamzat made it look easy. Shemaev now has three wins in his first 66 days in the UFC, which is a record by a far cry. He also has as many wins as he has strikes absorbed. Pretty sure that's got to be a record too. I say forget Maya in October and November or whatever. Give him another one on Fight Island here in the next week or two. Man, that right hand was so fast. Shemaev passes this test with flying colors. Maybe he truly is the future of the middleweight division. Maybe the future of the welterweight division. Maybe both. Ladies and gentlemen, the hype train still rolls on. The co-main event featured welterweights Donald Cerrone and Nico Price. This was the last decision win, and it wasn't even a win, it was a majority draw. 
As far as my predictions are concerned, I had a really good night. Almost all fights went and ended the way I had foretold, but not this one. I had Nico winning by first round KO, and to his credit, he really tried to satisfy that prediction. Nico came out guns blazing, looking for that finish. But a couple of pokes to Cowboy's eyes really threw him off his game and got him a point deducted. Nico decisively won the first round, but Cowboy had the last two much closer. This was a fun fight to watch, but honestly, I expected more fireworks. Nico is showing Cowboy a whole lot of respect here and not respect for his skill set. Nico's just obviously a really big fan of Cowboy. He kept apologizing for the eye pokes. He was high-fiving during the fight. He was laughing during the fight. I even felt that Cowboy was a little turned off by this, uh, this friendly type of fight. When the majority draw decision was announced, Nico seemed to be excited about it. Cowboy, though, true to form, would rather lose than tie. And he looked at Nico as if he thought the man were crazy for being happy about it. Still a good fight with both fighters making a good account of themselves. But if it hadn't been for those eye pokes, Nico would have left the victor. Cowboy is now five fights without a win, but he remains a fan favorite. And I still look forward to what's next for both of these guys. Then, of course, was a welterweight fight between number two, Colby Covington, and number five, Tyron Woodley. This really was a pretty easy one to predict. Less because of Colby's skill set, though, and more because of Tyron's mental state before the fight. This guy is just pretty much done. I'm sure Tyron could still devastate the majority of fighters out there. But when a fighter reaches the top like Tyron has, he can only fight top guys from then on out. And Tyron just can't perform with these guys any longer. I think he's got all the physical assets needed, but his mental game is weak. He's just lost the hunger. Colby looked much more reserved than usual, probably making sure he didn't get caught by Woodley's power. But as the fight went on, Woodley became more and more detached from it, and Colby piled on the pressure. Colby won every minute of this fight, which takes Woodley to a solid 15 rounds where he hasn't won a moment. It wasn't the domination we saw from Usman or Burns, but it was still domination. And it was probably enough to earn Colby a crack at the winner of the impending title fight. Woodley verbally ended this fight with a rib injury. And I haven't heard the extent of the damage to that rib, but I would not be surprised to learn that it's pretty minor. Woodley's just checked out and either needs some reinvigoration or for someone to throw him a retirement party. In my opinion, this is the third fight in a row where he quit somewhere in those 25 minutes. Colby will move on. And let's hope that Tyron's able to do so too. So there's the winners and losers of UFC Vegas 11. We got a great fight coming up this weekend, the first pay-per-view we've had in a while. I'm going to be releasing a few videos this week talking about that pay-per-view. So hit that subscribe button so you don't miss those episodes or my prediction video that's going to drop in the next few days. Till then. Oops.